wait for the attendees to join. Okay, we'll get going now. Hello and welcome to the third and final event of Trinity Term for the Oxford Forum for Questioning Extremism, titled Terrorism in West Africa, the Rise and Impact of Boko Haram. Today we'll be discussing the terrorist group Boko Haram and the operations across West Africa. We'll be in discussion for around 40 to 45 minutes. This leaves around 15 minutes at the end for questions from the audience. In this final segment, I will be able to unmute you and you can ask questions directly to our panelists by pressing the raise hand function. And also alternatively, you can ask questions by leaving a message in the chat box. It is now my pleasure to introduce our brilliant panel of experts. Today we have Mr. Bulama Bukati, who is a Sub-Saharan Africa analyst at the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change, where he leads and conducts research into violent extremism groups. We also have Andrew Walker, who is a journalist and author of Eat the Heart of the Infidel, The Harrowing of Nigeria and the Rise of Boko Haram. We have Dr. Olajimoke Jumo Ayandele, who is a human security and counterterrorism researcher, research consultant on the Africa desk at the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project. And lastly, we have Dr. Kate Meager, who is a, an associate professor in development studies at the London School of Economics and Political Science and co-editor of the book, Overcoming Boko Haram, faith, society, and Islamic radicalization in Northern Nigeria. Thank you all so much for coming on. Now, I would like to begin with a short introduction into what Boko Haram is. So, Bulama, if you don't mind, could you please tell us what you, you, you understand Boko Haram to be for people in the audience who are either hearing about Boko Haram for the first time or have a vague understanding of what this group is? Sure. Um, a great question. Hopefully nobody is hearing about Boko Haram for the first time uh, in the audience. But if any, uh, just a bit of a context. Uh, Boko Haram itself, uh, it's a combination of a Hausa and Arabic word. Uh, Boko is a Hausa word for Western styled education and Haram is an Arabic word for something that is Islamically forbidden. This is a moniker for the group. Uh, it doesn't call itself uh, such. Uh, in fact, it detests that name. It is a moniker given to it by locals, and it is a powerful summary of what the group stands for. It stands against everything that is seen as Western or secular, and is saying it's fighting to uh, replace secular systems and institutions with its own version of Islamic one. But the group officially calls it, uh, itself which is uh, people for the traditions of the prophet of Islam for, uh, for preaching and jihad. And this name also summarizes what Boko Haram stands for. It is a group that claims to be fighting for Islam. It started in the early 2000s and in the last 10 years, it has killed and estimated 50,000 people displaced about 3.5 million and have, has triggered an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in the Lake Chad region uh, in which over 7 million people are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. The group does all this and claims that its project is a divine mission that is rewarded by God and that they are working to install God's uh, law on that part of the country. Thank you so much for that. Hopefully, I hope that has cleared up everyone's understanding of what Boko Haram is. And now we want to go on to speak about the origins of Boko Haram and just the context in which it arose. So, Andrew, if you do mind, could you please tell us about the origins of Boko Haram and what factors, external or internal, you think led to and fostered the inception of this group? And is there any specific factor you think is the most pertinent? 
Yes, as Bolana said, the, it started in the early 2000s with a group around um, a particularly, particularly charismatic preacher uh, who had kind of worked through the 90s to kind of develop um, links with uh, uh, Salafi organizations, both in inside Nigeria and outside. And um, he had kind of drawn, gra gradually drawn together with, with the force of his questioning of the uh, Islamic um, uh, establishment in the, in the Northeast, uh, had sort of drawn together a group of uh, radical um, Salafi uh, uh, adherents. And uh, through various instances of um, uh, 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 where they came to, uh, there was a, a, a time in uh, the early 2000s where a group broke away from this group, started up a community in uh, a place called Kanama and uh, came into conflict with the, uh, the, uh, the establishment very quickly. They were all, um, well, to a certain large degree wiped out and the rump of this group continued to grow in, um, in uh, my degree. Um, through his own connections and his own wheel of dealing, he managed to get hold of a plot of uh, land uh, a bit right inside the town where this group was allowed to grow and kind of um, create contacts within the wider society with, within um, uh, and then began to be known within politics as uh, a force, a, a sort of social force. They developed through um, uh, donations from wealthy individuals and possibly some money from outside Nigeria. And uh, they became rather a, a powerful force in uh, my degree's social life in that they had uh, a, a farm in another state where they were providing jobs and work. Uh, they were then taking money from uh, other concerns, putting that back into their own community, buying um, motorbikes for people in order to, for them to, to raise money and all this sort of stuff. Um, they were functioning sort of as a, as, um, as, as a state within a state. Uh, this changed in 2007 onwards and um, Muhammad Yusuf, the, the person who was at the center of this uh, community, a very charismatic by all accounts preacher, uh, began to build up the tension and build up the rhetoric, build up the, uh, the challenge against the state um, and threats and began to issue threats of violence. Um, the, uh, the, eventually the military and the uh, police decided to in some way take him on. Uh, they kind of uh, provoked a, a conflict, and the followers of the uh, of, of Muhammad Yusuf, um, who had been preparing for this, broke out with weapons, with incredible violence, and uh, held uh, my degree for uh, you know under terrible circumstances, roving around the streets, killing people almost at, at, at random um, for about four or five days. Um, from then on, the, the state came back hard, smashed, the, uh, scattered everybody from the, from the streets at that particular time. And they went underground as suddenly famous, very in demand Islamists. And from the story, the story that we see now, from, you know, from then on until now, is the story of them coming back and developing into this rolling catastrophe that just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. Good. Does anyone have anything to add at this point? Dalama, yeah. No, I, I, I thought that was uh, a great um, summary of the origins uh, from Andrew. I just uh, wanted to add, uh, for example, when it comes to the question of origin, one thing that tends to be, mi uh, to be missed in analysis is this uh, important point that Muhammad Yusuf is not just a Salafist, he is someone with an interesting spiritual journey from a Sufi family, a, a traditional Sufi family. He became a Muslim activist and then drawn into this uh, pro-Iranian Shiite group. From there, he left to the Salafi organization. And what you saw as the key 
elements of Boko Haram's ideology is a combination of the most radical elements in each of these groups, not just the Salafis, but also the Shiites and from the Sufis and from traditional Islam that was practiced in that part of the country. So Muhammad Yusuf combined the most radical elements of all of these ideologies and then added the violent elements to it. And I think that's important to point uh, out in the origins. But not only him, because he's not just, uh, he's not the only founder. There was Muhammad Ali, who the literature would say had met Osama bin Laden in 1996 and had won uh, 3 million euros um, grant from Osama bin Laden to start an Al Qaeda affiliate in Nigeria. That theory is unsubstantiated. There is nothing, no evidence supports that. And all Boko Haram's four founding fathers studied and trained locally in Nigeria. None of them fought outside Nigeria, even though the literature wants to tell us otherwise. And so it's important for us to understand that this is a, cl a classic case of grassroots local radicalization and mobilization of young people by local preachers who then became global terrorists. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to to add to that as well. I think the the wider context is quite important. Well, you've had a well, we've been given a very sort of detailed um, initial history. Um, I think the emphasis on the fact that Boko Haram is a homegrown ex Islamic extremist group is a very important thing. It is not a product of global Islamic terrorism. It involves. Uh, local grievances expressed in the idiom of an Islamic society um, and is very much about uh, anti-corruption, uh, concerns about the nature of the state, um, also often tangled up with local grievances in various areas. So for example, where it started out in Meduguri, there were local grievances about lack of access to jobs, about inequality, uh, some of the places where it spread more extensively in uh, up in the Lake Ch Chad region. There was uh, also issues about uh, tensions between locals and Hausa migrants over access to fishing rights and where it spread quite rapidly in southern Borno very much around local tensions between uh, Christian and Muslim indigents in southern Borno uh, over access to jobs and economic uh, advancement. Um, so it's, it's very much uh, an, uh, a religious idiom expressing frustration and anger against the state. Um, and its religious idiom is also very much distorted by the fact that although the founders were all Muslims and claimed uh, Salafi training, there were also what are many of them referred to as autodidacts, particularly Yusuf himself. Salafism allows people to um, preach despite the fact that they might not have extensive formal Islamic training, which allows people to make all kinds of rational individual types of connections without grounding them effectively in recognized uh, Islamic theological schools. So there's a lot of kind of creative uh, Islam mixed up with news reports and personal interpretation through the framework of a very charismatic preacher, which is extremely unrepresentative, not only of Islam, but of Salafism itself. For example, Salafism is very much about capturing the state, whereas Boko Haram was very much about destroying and attacking the state. So its political project is very different from the core political project of Salafism. Thank you for that. Just to just to build on this discussion that we're having about Muhammad Yusuf, but I'm also quite curious about. Despite it's clear that Boko Haram was founded in the early 2000s, uh, but the insurgencies didn't really begin until about 2009, and Boko Haram didn't become become didn't really become seen as that big of a threat until then. I knew there were whispers within the country about them. However, the government didn't take it, from what I've read, didn't take it too seriously. But I was quite curious to know, what could you say about the difference between the leadership under Mohammed Yusuf and the leadership under Abu Bakr Shakal? Yes, uh, so uh, you are right that uh, Boko Haram uh, was founded in early 2000s. And, but then the major crisis did not uh, start to unfold until 2009. Now, that's because Boko Haram's founder, Muhammad Yusuf himself, explains that 
his mission from the very beginning is violence, but he needed time to recruit and radicalize and build capacity. And that was what, that was what he did for the first six years. And that's why, but even very early on, we have seen early warning signs. Uh, Andrew Walker was uh, talking about the Kanama commune, which was about 70 members of Boko Haram that broke away from the main faction because Yusuf was not moving fast enough in their judgment. And so they broke away in 2003. That was, a year, in fact, a few months after Boko Haram was founded. And then they went to a desert village first called Tarmoa and then to Kanama, both of which I visited last, just before the lockdown. Um, and I had, uh, I mean, I visited the sites. Uh, they, 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 they made their home in each where you would see the, the mosque they built. Uh, of course, the mosque has now been destroyed, but the, the, the well they built, for example, still has water. And I went to the farms they, they use as their shields and all that. Now, Boko Haram, Muhammad Yusuf and others were using that period of six years to build capacity and to recruit and to radicalize young people, but also to, to establish a capital base because they understood very well that they cannot pursue that project without money without uh, manpower. Now, under Muhammad Yusuf, perhaps Boko Haram was more uh, strategic when it comes to recruitment because he is a calmer person. He is more educated than Shekau, but let's understand that even Muhammad Yusuf is around a graduate level uh, when it comes to Islamic education. He's not that advanced in Islamic education. Uh, you can just say maybe a three or four year uh, student of a university if he were studying Islamic jurisprudence. And he was the most educated member of the group uh, in, the, in Islamic jurisprudence. Then you had Sheikhau who was raised in poverty and was uh, rearing animals. And he said, uh, by his own account, he said that hardened him. And he became uh, an angry young man even before he joined Boko Haram. And when he joined Muhammad Yusuf, he was called Darul Tawheed, the, the home of of monotheism because he was extra, he was an ultra extremist guy even in the early stages of Boko Haram. And that's why when he took over Boko Haram, the violence became more and more indiscriminate. Many people would argue that perhaps if it were under Muhammad Yusuf, Boko Haram wouldn't have become so indiscriminate in its attacks. But I can tell you, and this is the final point I would make, that if you read Boko Haram's manifesto, which is a 169 page Arabic book written by Muhammad Yusuf himself, you can see traces of the group becoming violent against civilians, including Muslim civilians. I can tell you there is hardly anything new that was introduced by Sheikh Al, And I just see him as someone who built on Muhammad Yusuf's project under different circumstances. Jumo, please. Yes, um, so I just wanted to add that one major difference between Sheikhu and Yusuf's leadership is the willingness of Sheikhu to um, affiliate the movement with you know, global terrorist organizations. So we don't see that shift or that change in tactics onto under Sheikhu and we see him moving from Al Qaeda to ISIS um, back to Al Qaeda as long as it you know, perpetuates its interest with recruitment, with training, with funding. So that's one fundamental difference that we see between the two leadership styles, that willingness to affiliate, that willingness to actually get support or help from other terrorist organizations in being more legitimate in being seen as a threat, not just in Nigeria, but in Western Africa. Okay. If I can just come in just very briefly there, it's I think also important to note that a lot of Shekau's um, affiliation with international organizations was more aspirational than actual. That he made a lot of claims about being linked to Al-Shabaab, being linked to ISIS, uh, but they were very rarely uh, reciprocated. Uh, the, the links with ISIS have come much, much later. And in fact, ISIS has explicitly recognized quite a different faction, which is referred to as um, um, ISWAP, rather than uh, the, the uh, main uh, Shekau faction of Boko Haram. So there, there's a bit of name dropping in the international connections. And one of the sad things I think about Boko Haram is that the international connections have really been developed because of the failure of the state to actually come to grips 
with the, the group. Um, and in a sense, the claim, the initial claims, which were um, involved uh, uh, claims about international linkages that were not very well actualized or were very sporadic, um, actually have turned into realities. And there are much more uh, distinctive links of um, ISWAP with ISIS. Thank you. And actually, just building on what you said, actually, I think like there's a common like understanding or just belief among people that Boko Haram is almost a unified group. I don't think many people realize that as from 2017, there's actually been recognized that there are three different factions which are referred to as Boko Haram. Jumo, if you don't mind, could you tell us what these three different factions are and what the similarities and differences are between them? And also, was there ever once a unified group of Boko Haram and did this split happen um, afterwards or has it always been different factions? Uh, thank you very much for that question. That's a very good question. So right now we have three groups. We have Ansaru, we have ISWAP as Kate has said, and then we have the main Boko Haram factions. And I believe ISWAP broke away from Boko Haram in 2012 and that's because they didn't necessarily agree with Sheikh's leadership style of targeting everyone and anyone that didn't necessarily believe um, in his version um, of Salafism. And that's how we see that break away in 2012. In 2016, I believe that's also what happened with ISWAP. Um, they wanted to distinguish themselves by protecting women and children in order to win the hearts and minds of communities in the Lake Chad region, as well as in Northern Borno, while Shiriko wanted to just target anybody that didn't believe in his own version of Salafism. So that's really the difference that we see. We see differences when it comes to who their targets are, but when it comes to tactics and strategies, it, it's the same. I mean, when it comes to funding, it's changed because it's evolving based off of what the state government does. Um, so we have different funding channels. Um, if the government, for example, blocked cattle as well as cattle rustling, we see, you know, ISWAP and Boko Haram shifting into like fishing, for example. So when it comes to tactics and strategies such as that, it's always evolving and it's always based off of what the state government is doing. So in that sense, yes, it, it's a little bit different, but when it comes to, you know, um, strategies and how they mobilize, how they recruit. I, I believe, you know, it, it's it's the same for all, all three different types of factions. Thank you so much. I think another thing that I think, well, we've all, you've all touched on this here that, well, I think a lot of people think that when the conversation of Boko Haram comes up, Nigeria is centered in this conversation. However, as you've all touched upon, there's actually the violence, acts of violence have spread into across the Lake Chad Basin and spread into Niger, Chad and Cameroon. And Kate, I'm just wondering what can be said about Boko Haram's operations in these states? How did they emerge? And again, just a similar, did their tactics differ to those that are followed in Nigeria? And are they pursuing a similar aim in these states? Um, the, the activities of Boko Haram are very much uh, spilling across the border kinds of issues. They're not independent um, uh, forms of organization. They're not independently rooted in society in Cameroon or Niger and Chad. It very much is, uh, in part, Boko Haram operative shifting across the border to escape security operations, uh, efforts to mobilize local youth. But particularly in Niger, where you have a lot of uh, the, the, the same um, population, same ethnic group, um, a lot of shared history, uh, Boko Haram hasn't managed to take root in anything like the way that in Niger that it has in Nigeria. Um, this is quite distinct from, say, the spread of Salafism uh, in or Izala, which is a local Salafist uh, movement. Um, where the argument is when Nigeria uh, catches cold, Niger sneezes and Islamic developments in uh, Nigeria tend to spill over into Niger and to, and to spread quite rapidly. Boko Haram has been much less successful in taking root. Um, it's, it, there are limited activities across the border in Difa region in, in Niger. Um, but the structure of the state and the structure of the education system in Niger, which is much more centralized, and the levels of inequality in Niger, which are much less, although Niger is poorer than Niger Nigeria, 
um, the levels of inequality are much, much lower in Niger. And that has created a framework in which it's more difficult for the levels of grievance and the, the escape from state control uh, to develop on the Niger side of the border. In Chad and Cameroon, again, it's sporadic outbreaks, local grievances, but it, it really hasn't managed to take root in the same way that it, uh, it has in its core um, source in Nigeria. Thank you, Jumo. I would actually argue otherwise, and you know, maybe this is based off of the measures that you know one would use to see whether Boko Haram is effective or whether they've been able to launch attacks in other countries. And yes, while Nigeria remains the epicenter with fifty percent of the group's attacks in in the country in Nigeria, in northern Borno, we see, you know, when you look at the data, either whether it's from ACLED or whether it's from GGT. We see a lot of activity going on in Niger, as well as Cameroon and Chad, and we cannot discount that because those attacks are increasing. They're against civilians, they're against military troops. And when we downplay that transnational nature of Boko Haram or its affiliate ISWAP, the ability to launch attacks in you know, different countries and we just say, oh, it's Boko Haram escaping and, you know, they're trying to evade security forces. That doesn't necessarily take into consideration the fact that they are deteriorating social and political conditions in the Lake Chad region. And my new paper that I write with the OECD really tackles this, uh, tackles the root as well as the complex crisis in the Lake Chad region and the ability of Boko Haram to continue to mobilize as well as recruit food soldiers. Because you know, when it comes to Boko Haram, it's not just Nigerian nationals. We also have Nigerians, we have Car Cameroonian nationals, we have Chadians. And that was one of the issues that you know, military officials talk about when it comes to you know, how do we you know, when, when, when they drop their arms and say they want amnesty with Operation Safe Corridor, for example, in Nigeria, and you have, you know, Chadians or Nigerians, you know, trying to go through the amnesty program in Nigeria, it's like, okay, so what do we do with, you know, these nationals? So we can't say, oh, Boko Haram doesn't necessarily have um, um, operations or, you know, doesn't necessarily have a hold in these neighboring countries. And, you know, most of the epicenter of the activities are in Nigeria. I think that really moves away from actually having effective policies that can actually effectively deal with this crisis that affects everybody, not just Nigeria. Does anyone have anything to say in response to that or? Kulama. I mean, I just felt um, what I understood uh, Ket to be saying is that there are Boko Haram operations, but uh, when it comes to recruitment and radicalization, it did not succeed in the three other countries as it did in Nigeria. And I agree with her. Uh, and that's, But that's not to say that there aren't Boko Haram members in Cameroon, Chad, and Niger who are mm -hmm. nationals of that, uh, those countries. Uh, for example, we know that uh, Boko Haram started uh, politicizing in Cameroon after the July 2009 crisis, uh, which Andrew uh, spoke to, when one of their founders, Mama Noor, fled from Nigeria to his mother's village in Cameroon. And while he was there for the, for the five years or so he stayed there, he politicized for the group. And when he was coming back to Nigeria, he came back with significant number of fighters who he recruited and then uh, came to Boko Haram's territory in 2014 after the group had declared a caliphate. And also in Chad, um, I was in Chad in September of 2019, and I chatted to Chadian former Boko Haram members, and there are hundreds of them, um, uh, most, mostly from the Guduma uh, tribe, which is a border community, mostly in Chad, but also partly in Niger and Nigeria. So Boko Haram's ideology did spread to the three other countries, but uh, nowhere near what we saw in the northeastern part of Nigeria. And their operation mostly in these three other countries uh, in remote communities, not like in Nigeria where you saw operations in cities and major towns. Uh, it did not succeed uh, to that extent uh, in the other countries. And I think that's partly because of the factors uh, kept spoke. So yes, there are operations, and yes, there are big Boko Haram members from the three other countries, but mostly 
Nigerians, uh, I mean, it is mostly in Nigeria that the uh, group uh, succeeded significantly. Thank you. Oh, I just wanted to move on to just, just focusing on the particular acts of violence by um, Boko Haram. The act of violence by Boko Haram that caught the act of by Boko Haram that actually caught the quite maybe quite easily the most. Um, global attention has been the 2014 kidnapping of 276 Chibok girls. This left to a global movement known as hashtag bring back our girls, which garnered a lot of public support. A very well circulated image was that of the then first lady, Michelle Obama, holding a, a, a card saying bring back our girls. And Andrew, I was just curious, why do you think this event brought so much attention to Boko Haram? And just what impact do you think it had on the way Boko Haram, Haram was viewed and also the impact in the way they continue to operate? Did it like change their style or did it, almost encourage them to go down this path of even more kidnappings. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's absolutely the case that it, it changed the way that they operate. Um, it was almost uh, taking, from what I understand from um, uh, the, the, the stories that have come out of the, the, the incident, taking the girls was almost uh, an afterthought to them at the time. They, um, they really had gone to get something else and either it wasn't there or it, it, they, they were attracted by something else or uh, something basically spurred them up to take up to these, um, these uh, dormitories of, uh, of girls from the school. And um, it really, I think it was, you know, some time before the news kind of really filtered back, but it really hit a, a kind of sweet spot of uh, several converging things in going on in, mostly in, in Europe and in the West and in, in, it spoke to those communities rather than the actual situation on the ground in Nigeria. Um, it was, you know, picked up by a lot of um, people in a kind of, in a, a very similar way that uh, another viral um, African focused campaign had done a few years before. It was about the Lord's Resistance Army and uh, the, um, uh, a, a, a campaign to catch uh, Joseph Kony on you um, was, you know, went stratospheric because of because of the people who were tweeting it, rather than the inherent things of the issue. Um, you know, because, for example, a few weeks before that, um, uh, 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 um, Boko Haram fighters had flooded into a town found a, a couple of dormitories of boys and slaughtered every single one of them and the story had gone nowhere. You know, it was difference between the cultural cachet of a group of live female children and the cultural cachet of a bunch of dead African boys. You know, that's the two different things. Um, and this was, to them, it, I think, you know, to them it was a, a surprise as well. Um, the, they had the shortest time between releasing another, as soon as they twigged on that this, that this was getting them noticed, they, they released another uh, um, uh, uh, video trying to combine, you know, a video of Shekau and his particular rantings with a, with a, a picture of the girls. Um, so they were in, onto it immediately that this was something, gonna be something that was gonna make them special. Um, I think that it, 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 it sort of, you know, um, to them, it it represented a uh, a problem that they had. <clears throat> it represented, <coughs> excuse me, it represented a solution to a problem they had, which is, in order to attract more people, they have to be able to give out uh, benefits, and one of the things that they judged would attract most young men to um, uh, to their cause would be, you know, the opportunity to give uh, that person who was arriving into camp, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to, I mean, I'm going to put it in, in scary air quotes, marry, um, uh, in, in reality, sexually abuse, uh, 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 in, in most cases, uh, a, a girl who they'd seized from, um, you know, uh, an area which traditionally, I mean, I say traditionally, but 
I don't mean in the kind of um, uh, organized religion sense of it, but in, in, the, in history, these areas have been raided for slaves by um, groups of uh, young men for you know, generations. And um, uh, this was a kind of reestablishing of that as a as as a uh, as a as a thing that existed. You know, people. Uh, at one point, Chacal said, "You know, uh, we will take them." You know, people were saying, "Well, what's he going to do with all these girls?" And he said, "We will. You know, we will recreate the slave markets with these girls." And it was a chilling, obviously incredibly chilling and terrible experience for for uh, for them but they became also sort of pawns in this crazy um uh, 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 situation where there are there exist out there people who form sort of non-governmental individuals if you see what i mean who are able to kind of get out and and put their hooks into an issue and use that as a as a thing to drive money and to drive interest in themselves. And it, it, the central tragedy of what was happening to these girls became this really, you know, in some cases obscene um, circus uh, of, of, of exploitation. And it, it really kind of um, uh, made a, a, left a bad taste in, in many people's mouths, I think. And it, it there was another, another uh, uh, element to this in that whilst some, um, you know, were released after a, um, a negotiation brokered by uh, Swiss intermediaries and, um, uh, and others, um, really that wasn't any kind of proper solution to the problem because obviously, you know, these girls are incredibly traumatized and will have you know, problems re reintegrating into their lives for the rest of their for the rest of their lives. It's also spurred on because they were probably paid. With, I'm not entirely sure what the whether we know how much yet, but there was also people released who had been kidnapped. Uh, who their commanders who had been arrested were released back into them, and this just you know perpetuates the conflict, keeps it going, and also creates a a a. a a, a new market for, for kidnap. They had previously tried to kidnap people um, for money, um, but it had gone very badly. Um, and then there was a, another, after Chibok, there was another kidnap where they kidnapped some French um, people in, a uh, French family in Cameroon. And uh, they were uh, paid a huge ransom by, the, um, by the, the, the company that they worked for. And all of this, just kind of engineered more conflict and drove it on more and more and more and more. And I think probably also contributed to the, in, 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 a, in, a, in a way contributed to the split between uh, what would become the Jas uh, Shakao's faction of Boko Haram and the, um, and the Iswap faction, um, which has, you know, uh, led to a situation now where not only have we got a state which is absolutely incapable of deploying any resources on the ground to, to, to reestablish control or to guarantee even the most basic parts of the, 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 the issue, um, the duties of the state to its, uh, its citizens in terms of security. It now has, you know, two, at least, possibly three, uh, we can talk about that, I don't know whether, we, whether there is actually uh, any time, but, um, uh, Area, you know, groups which in theory could establish control over geographical areas and begin to grow as kind of non, you know, uh, uh, a form of governance in a kind of perverted way, uh, it, it, as the, 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 the idea of the nation state and its capacity is sort of withdrawn, like, like the tide rolls back, you know, what's left is not anarchy, it's this terrible, um, uh, you know, warring factions who split the conflict, in this case, literally over women's bodies. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. And just as the last question from me for today, I just want to ask Jumo, 
what is the current counterterrorism strategies in place to defeat Boko Haram? Do you think these are adequate at the moment? And do, what else do you think needs to be done in order to successfully combat this group? Wow, that's a very loaded, loaded question. <laughs> and I will um, try to answer it. And if my other panelists can jump in, um, I would appreciate that. Um, so right now, the current counterterrorism strategy is definitely very based on the war model. So, you know, we have the military launching attacks as well as offensives um, against the group and its affiliate, um, ISWAP. We also see the military right now um, building um, super camps, which are basically garrisons um, to try to protect um, civilian populations in cities in the northwest or in the northeast um, and then we have the regional counterterrorism force the joint task force the mngtf um, with benin chad cameroon niger and nigeria and that's to help um, nigerian troops uh, with the escaping of boko haram um, members into these states so to just try to stop that so that's basically the you know in a nutshell the counterterrorism strategy, but then we also know that the Nigerian government has enacted Operation Safe Corridor, which is an amnesty program um, for nonviolent Boko Haram members to lay down their arms and be um, integrated, reintegrated into society. So it's trying to move away from a solely military response um, into, you know, non-military measures and seeing how that can work, which, you know, the, the, that has its own challenges uh, with the implementation and how it's been received by local communities. Now, is this enough? Um, it depends on who you ask, but I definitely do not think it is enough. I think for the most part, you know, not just the Nigerian government, but also surrounding neighboring states have really just only focused on the terrorism component of Boko Haram and not necessarily thought about, you know, the root causes of why the group is still thriving. So as Kate had said, you know, the ability to use deteriorating social as well as political conditions and couch it in a, you know, religious narrative has continued to allow for Boko Haram to recruit as well as mobilize foot soldiers. And although right now we have the regional stabilization strategy, which is a non-military effort that is trying to include non-military actors in trying to stabilize the Lake Chad region. So, you know, they're trying to include more civil society, religious leaders, traditional leaders to help with conflict, as well as uh, economic regional plan with, you know, development initiatives. You see that a lot of funding is not being pumped into that non-military strategy. Um, and we need more funding. Um, it's one of the things that I talk about in my recent OECD papers about the need to reintegrate more non-military actors when we're trying to stabilize the region. And you know, this focus on, as I said, the terrorism component and you know, trying to increase the capacity of the military, whether it's intelligence, whether it is training, um, whether it is equipment support has continued to affect the types of strategies or, and rather the types of assistance that a lot of these member states, including Nigeria, are willing to ask for from the international community. So, so yes, um, uh, military strategies are, are essential, but they're incomplete. They need to be done side by side with development initiatives um, in stabilizing um, the Lake Chad region, as I said, it's a very, very loaded question and depending on who you ask and the types of measure that you're using, some would say it's been successful, others would say it's not been successful. Thank you so much for that, Andrew. Yeah, I, I think Jim is exactly right in that, it, you know, there are, there should be multi-part kind of, uh, not just a military thing is necessary, but also a non-military component. One of the um, ironies of this situation, one of the intricacies of it, is that you know uh, what people think of as governance in 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 Nigeria often breaks down into a kind of um, rough form of patronage, in that you know the the relationship between citizen and leader is one of patronage, in that you know I give you even this small amount of money when it comes to uh, you know, election time or, you know, someone in your community gets a position, 
with uh, uh, you know another body, or you 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 get your youth gets a put an opportunity to get drafted into the army. All of these kind of patronage ways, instead of non-military solutions being talked about in the kind of terms of the proper uh, duties of the state in terms of you know providing the things that we would take for granted like security you know uh, all this kind of stuff what it actually breaks down to is a rough form of patrimonialism in that you know we have to then buy people off by giving them amnesty you know this is not just happening in the northeast this is happening in the in the, in the southeast as well you know in the south south and will probably happen in the northwest as well with you know uh, uh, bandits there and it, it's this it's it's further the the more they kind of try and diversify the response the more it becomes the same old thing in terms of governance you know if you've got a hammer everything looks like a nail this is nigeria's nail they're going to keep hitting it it's going to keep getting them nowhere. But every time that they do it, also faith in the state recedes. The ability of the state recedes further. The, you know, the, 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 the kind of the idea of there being a state in which you, know, you, you can kind of list the, um, the, the duties and the responsibilities and score it out 10 is just a fiction now. It's, and it's becoming more and more so. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Kate. I could just come in on that uh, very briefly. I, I think that one of the problems with counterterrorism strategies is that on the one hand, by almost by definition now, they tend to pathologize Islam and local actors. And one of the biggest problems with Boko Haram is a lot of the people who are devising the strategies are people from outside the region whereas a huge amount of local knowledge about local grievances and problems of local disaffection and uh, the kinds of things that are needed to draw local youth and families in other directions uh, where they're vulnerable to recruitment, those kinds of actors, local NGOs, uh, various types of elders, fora, et cetera, um, are very much um, marginalized from the flows of resources. Uh, a lot of counterterrorism strategies explicitly um, uh, precludes the directing of resources to high-risk areas and to, to local populations that uh, don't uh, subscribe to or know how to operate in the aid-intensive, management-intensive um, uh, consultancy realm that uh, international actors are used to. And a second major concern, I think, is that it also tends to focus attention on the military elements rather than on the core causal issues, as uh, Jumal pointed out, um, which are largely economic, about job creation, about corruption, about uh, focusing on opportunity, creating opportunity in the North, which gets uh, very little in terms of the focus of, of resources. And instead you have a situation where not only the Nigerian state, but the international community really treat Boko Haram as a kind of ATM machine from which resources can be generated and used. And although there is a desire to contain and in some ways eliminate the conflict, it's also been very useful both for the international community and for the Nigerian state to not only uh, draw resources, but establish bases in various places. A huge amount of uh, the aid industry is now very invested in it. Uh, I don't wish to suppose to insinuate that they want to keep Boko Haram going, but the things that are most needed to stop it are not the things that they're focusing on. Jumo, yeah, very briefly, please. Yeah, and I wanted to follow up on Kate's point, and it's a question that you know I would want to leave us with as well as the panelists is the Boko Haram situation because development initi initiatives are more expensive than you know counterterrorism initiatives and that's why the former isn't necessarily being touted as you know the way to address stabilization efforts not just in Nigeria but in the Lake Chad region. So that is one question that I would want to leave us with. And you know, maybe my other panelists would be willing to discuss or we can take this offline. 
thank you all so much for that very insightful uh oh andrew yeah just one one very brief thing i, I mean, on the terms of uh, counterintelligence and uh, counterterrorism it's really hard uh in terms of current thinking about these things it's hard to find one example where it's actually worked i put that question out there is there one that you know that this is that this counterinsurgency has actually worked thank you all so much for that very insightful and very eye-opening discussion so we'll now move on to the q a portion of this event for the last 10 minutes as i said earlier if you have any questions please raise your hand and i will unmute you alternatively you can send your questions to the chat box as we have received so far so the first question we've gotten is from zoe and she asked, how do you see the unexpected death of Idris Debe affecting regional dynamics to counter Boko Haram? Would anyone like to take that? Jiwa. I can take that. Um, so it's definitely affected um, the MNJTF as well as the ability of Nigerian troops to counter Boko Haram. So we've seen, especially in the last two weeks, three weeks, we've seen a lot of attacks by I ISWAP as well as you know the core Boko Haram groups on military offensives, not just in super camps, but also in remote areas. And you know, in academia we say correlation is not equals causation, but one can't help but wonder whether this death is the ability of ISWAP to regroup as well as launch these offensives to show that they are still a force to be reckoned with, they're, they're still a threat. And even though you know, the Ramadan season has ended, you know, a lot of people, a lot of analysts, a lot of policy practitioners were very, very surprised at the increased rates of attacks. And not just on Nigerian troops, we're seeing a lot of attacks on humanitarian actors. Um, and a lot of people are wondering why and whether this can be stemmed with a strong power man in Chad um, in helping to motivate and incentivize a lot of this MNJTF troops um, around border towns. Yeah. Uh, I, oh, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, I, I see it to Bulama. Oh, sorry. No, please go for it, Andrew. I can come after you. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything intelligent, please. Okay. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was just going to say I have read uh, lots of analysis uh, uh, in the wake of Idris Davis' uh, death, um, uh, uh, predicting that there is going to be uh, increased attacks or um, the regional forces would be weakened because uh, the strong man has died. But I, I just uh, don't uh, see the evidence in the analysis. Uh, for number one, um, Idris Devi is dead, but his uh, government continues. Uh, he deliberately groomed Muhammad to take over after him. And he, Muhammad is not a, uh, a novice. He knows his father's allies and he knows his father's way of uh, working and it is just a continuation of Devi after Devi. Uh, with regards to the attacks, um, I think Jimo is right that we shouldn't be in a haste to relate that to Devi's death because we know Boko Haram uh, because, uh, as part of its spiritual effort when it's Ramadan, they feel jihad rewards, uh, gives more reward in Ramadan just like other acts of worship and that's why they increase attacks in Ramadan. And so that was what happened, not, Deb, uh, not Davis' death. For example, even before it is David died, there weren't Cadian soldiers on Nigerian uh, soil. They have been in Chad and perhaps in some parts of Sahel. And perhaps what will happen after the transition is Muhammad David would continue because he would contest and then recreate his father's uh, way. And that will be it. Uh, so I just feel um, it is better for researchers to to keep a bit calm and study the situation further before we start making conclusions just because uh, Debbie is dead. The way I think Debbie's death might affect the security landscape is if the, the rebels inside Chad continue to get uh, more powerful and lethal. And if the ruling class in Chad feels threatened and then starts now 
withdrawing its resources from outside the country into the country to, to, to coil the fire inside the house. Otherwise, nothing would change. It would just continue the way it is. Uh, finally, as to Andrew's question around whether countermeasures have succeeded anywhere, uh, there, there is hardly any example to come by aside of the ISIS example. We saw how massive international offensive in Iraq, Iraq and Syria decimated the ISIS caliphate. We are not saying ISIS is gone, but we know that ISIS was reduced to less than 10% of its former state capacity as a result of that massive offensive. But on the African soil, if we continue to pursue the same military strategy that hasn't worked in the past decade, then this problem will continue to be interactive, not only in the lectured region, but also in the Sahel, Southern Africa and East Africa. And that's why I would think if we want to adopt a military approach, it's got to be sustained massive offensive that will decimate the groups. And after they are decimated, you start addressing the root causes. You can't build schools, hospitals, infrastructure when you have a group that will literally come uh, in a day to destroy your work for three months, six months, and development when the conflict is still on. Andrew, please, anything you to add before? Hello? Hello? Oh yeah, Andrew, is there anything you'd like to add? No, no, that's fine. Uh, I, I think um, in terms of the Chad question, uh, I think already uh, Chad was, before Debbie's death, Chad was very wary about becoming the, the kind of the, the, the major partner in the multinational joint task force because they have such a, a much better motivated, supplied and um, uh, led armed forces that they were very, they were wanting to pull back from the whole thing even then, because they, they, Nigeria doesn't want them, well, doesn't want Chadian soldiers coming in across its borders anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, the temptation is to let the stronger partner do the most, <laughs> the more kind of thing and, and uh, allow the military to get on with their real purpose, which is something else. Um, uh, yeah, uh, otherwise, I think that, that that's uh, an excellent summary from uh, Bilema and, uh, and Jimmy. Great. Another question we have from the audience is from an anonymous attendee. Does anything like prevent slash channel or education pro programs around extremism exist in the region? Young people vulnerable to radicalization could then be viewed more in terms of victims who need safeguarding. Would anyone like to comment on that? Kate? Um, there are various types of de-radicalization programs, but I think one of the biggest problems is that the recruitment into Boko Haram is not based primarily on Islamic radicalization. There are all sorts of different methods through which people become involved in Boko Haram. Some of it was actually becoming involved before it was a terrorist organization and finding it difficult to exit. Some of it is through capture, uh, the Chibok girls, for example, some is through people being drawn in by family or friendship linkages, wives, daughters, brothers, sons, etc. Um, uh, some of it is purely economic. Boko Haram uh, gives them money to do things, and so they do. Or it's uh, you no, know, their their access to jobs, motorcycles, uh, various types of activity. So there are all kinds of reasons why people are there, and one of the more limited ones is a real commitment to a radical Islamic vision. So it's really important, I do agree, that a kind of safeguarding approach to youth and uh, finding alternative economic opportunities for them and addressing some of the, the radical ideas that they may have taken on. Um, but uh, Quranic knowledge and uh, radical Islam are really only a part of what brings people into Boko Haram and only a part of what can take them out of it. Lama, would you like to ask about yeah no i i agree with uh chet uh, that um that islamic radicalization is just one of the factors but i would argue that it's a major 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 factor i have seen many analysis that will treat uh radicalization or ideology as just a marginal factor some would even say it doesn't play a role it's economics is uh 
social, uh, it's that, it's this. Um, many of them don't explain what we see inside Boko Haram. Boko Haram is very clear that it's on a divine mission. And we have seen fighters being celebrated for dying to go to the paradise. And we have seen fighters who were captured crying for not attaining martyrdom, for not attaining, not achieving martyrdom. They, they would say they wanted to die. And nobody, I mean, all of the young people in Boko Haram know that Boko Haram is not employment. It is a way to die. And they are going there to die because we are operating on a different time scale with them. Uh, it is on this fundamental idea that if they kill, they will get rewarded by, with paradise by God. And if they, they are killed, they die automatically as martyrs who would go to the paradise. And that's why you would see them rushing into the firing line when the Nigerian armed, armed forces are firing. And I think that's important to be addressed. As Kate said, there are de-radicalization programs in Nigeria and now spring them up, up across the three other countries. But I think what we need and what we have not seen uh, from the government side um, is this uh, effort uh, from the questioner around prevent trying to young, reach young people and immunize them before Boko Haram reaches them. And even without Boko Haram, we know that there are extremism issue, not violent extremism, but extremism issue in some parts of uh, the, the northeastern part of Nigeria. The effort currently is mostly by CSOs. Uh, there is one I frequently uh, serve as a resource person for that is working with Muslim uh, clerics, journalists, um, uh, community-based organizations to do those kinds of work. The Nigerian government has said it was going to start doing it in 2018, but we still haven't seen anything. And a big part of addressing Boko Haram is addressing these radical elements of the ideology that is driving young people to believe that what they are doing is a divine project that is rewarded by God, not criminality. That's a big part of the ideology and the mindset, and that has got to be added. Thank you all so much. And just very briefly, the last question we have, I understand that we're a bit over. Uh, would anyone like to ask, uh, what, are the what about the current state of Nigeria would you say is truly allowing Boko Haram to succeed and what's really sustaining its presence and its, yeah, just its success thus far? Can I tell yeah. I, I think that, you know, in terms of an actual, you know, um, existential threat to a, a properly functioning state, you've got to say that of all of the people who are involved in this insurgency, there's probably, you know, less than 10,000 at any one time. Um, you know, it, it, in a properly functioning state, it wouldn't have got to this point. You know, you, you would have had something, you know, similar to, um, the forces that kind of push this thing through, push this thing together, come up and go down in a kind of cyclical pattern in places like Nigeria and West Africa. Uh, and you can also see the, the, the sort of same stories repeated in, um, in European countries in some instances, like, you know, a, a charismatic radical drawing people together, takes over, exploits holes in the state, and, and kind of gets away with it. For example, um, the, in the 70s with the, uh, uh, the East German um, uh, communist radicals, the Red Army Fraction, um, what, what happened there was that they computerized the benefit records of Germany and that shrunk the pool in which they could, they could, they could do that. There's really not that much ability for the Nigerian state to do something like that. Uh, it doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the, the, the legitimacy from um, its citizens in order to push through um, you know, a technology-based reform in order to shrink the capacity of the, of the insurgents to, to keep going. So it, whilst there, you know, if you look closely, um, you can see that these forces happening all over the world and in many different places, it's only in a, in a particular set of circumstances which are you know, to do with um, the agreements between the state and its people, a social contract, that these people can be kind of controlled and wiped out. 
I would say that not only is that becoming less possible in West Africa, it's also becoming less possible. The, so, uh, the social contracts are breaking down, um, in, not to the same degree, but in the same sim similar sorts of ways um, in a lot more places, for example, my own country. Thank you for that answer. And thank you all so much for attending today. Thank you for, yeah, just thank you for this event. Thank you to our panelists for joining us and giving us these fantastic insights on Boko Haram. This is a group that has been around for a long time and we see in the news, but thank you for giving us more information and educating us on the matter. And thank you to the attendees and everyone who's come to watch. I hope you all have a fantastic rest of the day and week. Thank you again and yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs>